Uh, so the EU set up a very ambitious prosecutor's office but gave them only four people to work with. How is that possible? Here to answer is EU observer Nikolai Nielsen. Uh, yeah, yeah, Corona, arm, Corona. Arm. Uh, please uh, take uh, take this seat. Uh, you have your own microphone. Okay. Um, Nikolai, uh, I think uh, about a month ago I, I read the EU Observer, and there was a story from you that really like baffled me uh, about the EU Prosecutor's Office. How did you find out about this? Well, I just, you were, I talk like a rapper. Yeah. So I, I I just listened to Laura Koloshi. She was kind of presentation of the European Parliament. And she made uh, these uh, statements, which I thought were extraordinary. So she only has four people to sit through around 3,000 cases on day one of her job, which should be launched at the end of this year. Okay, it's, it's, it's a bizarre story. Let's start at the beginning. How big is the problem of embezzlement with EU funds? Well, I mean, there's different figures, but um, Olaf once said something like 635 million euros in, 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 in one particular year. Yeah, 2015? That's a lot of money. Absolutely, but I, I suspect it's much greater than that. In fact, VAT fraud alone is, is maybe up to 60 billion, euro, billion euros a year. So imagine I, I want to steal some money from Europe. How can I do it? Well, I mean, just petty corruption. I mean, there's embezzlement. There's, um, you can cheat on public procurements. Um, and you can just game the system. Okay, so I heard the stories of there were uh, conferences with EU money in uh, somewhere in Italy, and then they, they had the signatures, but the signatures turned out from the villagers, all, and it was, there was no conference at all. Yeah, I mean, there are stories like that that float around everywhere, and I mean, most recently, I think the New York Times expose really laid it out. Yeah, so, but they said it's not only creative entrepreneurs somewhere, they have ties to the highest people in office, such as Prime Minister Orban of Hungary and Mr. Babic of the Czech Republic. How are they involved? Well, so the New York Times piece used some key words. They described it as mafia land grabs, um, uh, what's, what's it, legalized corruption, modern feudalism and a thief economy that I think does perfectly describe what's happening. And uh, well, the Czech Prime Minister, one, he's a billionaire, who was actually fired in 2017 as finance minister because of tax evasion claims, which he always denied. But anyways, this guy had set up a, a conglomerate um, company called Agrofert, um, which is worth $3.5 billion, or right, euros. And it received 40 million euros in farm subsidies, EU farm subsidies, that's our taxpayer money, last year alone. And is it because he just knows how to get the money or is it just plain theft? Well, look, he, he, no, he, he no longer owns this company, he divided it into two trusts, but his family, I think his wife, is actually sitting in one of these trusts, so he's got these connections. Anyways, in this particular case, they call it a conflict of interest because he's also negotiating the EU budget. When it comes to Orban, um, you know, the Times piece described it, that he was saying he was auctioning off um, land, state land, to families and close associates. And then th that land was then uh, entitled to EU subsidies. And so this is part of a broader systemic issue here in Europe. Okay, so, uh, so even to the, the highest regions... Absolutely. So, and is he caught red-handed or is just allegedly there is something wrong? No, it's definitely, it's definitely totally wrong. So, so why is he in jail yet? Well, because, I mean, look, this, it's, it's like uh, you game the system, you're not really committing, um, a, a, like say, something illegal, he didn't but you're abusing the system, right? Mm. And so they, they, they use it to create sort of like uh, loyalties among their little circle of friends. And yeah, that's, that's, how, that's how they do it. Okay. But the EU has a specific organization for fighting crime, which is OLAF. Right. So and what's wrong with that? Well, OLAF can only do so much. I mean, they, they file these administrative reports, which give recommendations for national prosecutors to follow up on them. But, you know, national prosecutors don't have to. And so, you know, um, and also they got better things to do. For instance, in their mind, they'd rather work on national issues than dig into EU funding. Why? It's a priority. It's a priority for them. Because they get, they get a bigger Christmas bonus if they do national things, or? I think they. I think. I mean, it's just you know, it's their 
taxpayer money that's on the on the table. So they have a greater interest in pursuing those investigations. But if, if Olaf just gives the case with a ribbon on it, they just have to. That's how simple it is. Yeah, but it doesn't always happen like that. Some of them just don't go anywhere. Okay, so one one example is uh, commis uh, uh, John Daly. He was a commissioner under Barroso. What did he do? Oh my God! Yes, now this guy, this was an interesting case. Okay, so he was um, uh, Malta's uh, European Commissioner for Health, and he got caught up in, in in a tobacco lobbying scandal, and the commission basically fired him over this. But um, so the commission handed over the Olaf handed over the report to the Maltese authorities. It never went anywhere. And in fact, it ended up backfiring on the head of Olaf, a guy named Giovanni Kessler, who ended up getting his immunity stripped because of wiretapping allegations, which is illegal here in Belgium. So he could potentially end up, I don't know, in jail. Okay, so, so that was a, a rather curious twist of events. So instead of a medal, he got... Well, now, today, this guy, Kessler, he's got, he has a desk job at the European Commission, follow reports the way he reads. Oh my! Nice. Okay, so instead of the hero, he's the so the, the European leaders thought so. This uh, Olaf is not gonna gonna do it. And during the negotiations in the 2007 Lisbon Treaty, they said we are gonna have a European Prosecutor's Office. And then what happened? Nothing until 2013 when the European Commission. Oh wait, so for, for 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 seven years, nothing happened. No, I think they had other things to do. I suppose. I mean, there was the enlargement and stuff like that. And, and eventually, in 2013, the commission finally proposed something, but then nothing happened. Uh, I think until about a year later, when you had LuxLeaks, which was this huge media expose of, 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 of tax scandals, and then it was followed by Panama Papers, and that really gave the impetus for people to finally but sign up to it. I, I'm from Holland. Our Prime Minister has been bitching about the 0.1% of GDP right. the past months. This is about theft of EU funds. He must be totally in favor of a strong prosecutor. Well, when you know it, that Netherlands was the one was one of the um, countries, along with Sweden, by the way, which actually opposed it. Why? Because they were thinking, well, you know, we don't need this. We're doing a good enough job, and this is a, an issue of sovereignty, and we don't need the EU to be picking through our, our, our books. Um, one country, Italy, um, had actually wanted had also opposed it, but on different grounds. They said it didn't go far enough. They wanted a stronger prosecutor. But of course, Hungary is not a part of it. Poland is not part of it either. But, so the Netherlands thinks it's more important to keep our sovereignty than the EU not be stolen for like a billion a year. At that time, now they've signed up to it. So at that what, time, changed, they were, what changed in the meantime? Look, you know, I think, I think, like I said, I think it's, you had these, 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 these scandals of LuxLeaks, Panama Papers, and things like that, that really created groundswell that, that were the public were just furious for what was happening, and so um, I think um, politics played. And is it because America. they really wanted to do something about it, or because they said we need to have a headline in the newspaper? We're doing something. Well, you know that 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 we have to see because the, the this new prosecutor's office has yet to be launched. But well, they they first went to find a prosecutor, yeah. and they found Laura Covesi. Uh -huh. How bad is she? She's badass. How badass? <laughs> Look, I mean, she, she was so badass that they fired her in Romania in 2018 because she was really going after the, the, the big guns. I mean, within two years, she had, she had, I think, prosecuted something like 1,700 people, high, high top-level corruption, and clawed back almost a billion euros in Romania for two years. So, you know, this is somebody who's not afraid of going after Okay, so boys. this is a good start. So uh, right. the people who, who appointed her, is that the commission or? Uh, well, you know, there was a debate that was going on and finally she was uh, appointed through, well, a lot of negotiations, but eventually she made it and got the backing of the member states, not all of them, but uh, uh, back of the member states and the European Parliament. Okay, so this is a good start. We have an ambitious prosecutor office, uh, prosecutor, but then she's been given only four people Right. Well, I mean, she has her, her staff is around 29 people, but almost all of them work in administration and human resources. But she has only four people to sift through what she expects to be about 3,000 cases on day one. So, so she has, has more people to do human resource than yeah. actual human resource. I, yeah, I don't, don't ask me about that. That is frustration. <laughs> but that's, 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 that, it is what it is. And so, yeah.
And yep. is this a honest mistake? Did something go wrong, or was she actively uh, worked against? You know, I think I think they want to turn her into sort of a paper tiger, and you know, they want to sort of uh, uh, make her job difficult. Who wants to make her job difficult? The member states. But we okay. But the Netherlands have changed. Didn't they really change? Well, you know, right now this is the thing. You know, it's on paper. They put someone who has ambition on the job, she needs resources, she needs money, and really she's unable to really, really uh, start from the, well, from the starting line. So uh, we'll, we'll see, I mean, she's really, she's really trying to get that money. Okay, but uh, it seems like a wise investment, because for every person you give her, she will earn it 10 times back. Yeah, 20, 30, I mean, if she does her job properly, yeah, absolutely. Okay, and uh, she's kind of popular because in Hungary, almost uh, uh, 680,000 people signed a petition to join this prosecutor's office. Um, is it that popular? Well, I, I mean, it's, if, I mean, if those 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 numbers are correct, so yeah, possibly so. But you know, Hungary is, is not is not part of the deal, and so you know, uh, the New York Times ex say on cap or farm subsidies, it won't fall under her jurisdiction. So, you know, what, what can you do? Okay, but how is this going to go forward? So she's there as a Tutor Stag, is now everybody happy or is she going to bite back? Look, she's really lobbying to get more money. The commission finally agreed to give her an extra 3 million euros over the next three years. But again, this is the budget negotiations that are going on, um, you know, the MFF and all this stuff. So, uh, you know, I don't know. I mean, we'll have to wait and see, I guess. You know? how, how, can, how can it be influenced? Who, is going, who can push some buttons to either make it work or not? I think uh, she has to get support from some of the, the biggest member states, you know, maybe Germany, France, you know, and the commission, they, they're, they're supporting her to, to a certain degree. Um, they obviously want this to work because, you know, they're handling the EU budget as well. So, yeah. And who's the biggest enemy? The biggest enemy? <sighs> Look, I would say the people like uh, Babish. And uh, how long can they keep uh, uh, playing with her before she says, I'm going to give up? Well, she's got seven years to do this job. So, uh, you know, she's, well, I think she's 46, so she's relatively young. Um, I don't think she's going to be going anywhere. So. How much money would you put on it in seven years from now she has a very efficient office? I don't know. I, I really won't put any money on it. <laughs> we, we just heard that the whole budget negotiations, they went down on 0.1% of GDP. Mm -hmm. The big leaders are, 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 are fighting over almost nothing. Wouldn't it be a good deal if the, the Scrooges say, you know what, we don't give the EU more money, but we give her a super office with like 300 prosecutors, and every euro she gets back, the EU may keep. Then we have I mean, look at the conundrum here. I mean, she's going to be digging into the, the budgets of member states and looking for fraud. And if she finds fraud that implicates government and state actors, that's going to reflect badly on them. And these are politicians at the end of the day. So, you know, self-interest prevails. Well, we're, we're going to see how this is going to continue. We're going to read all about it in the Observer, because you're going to follow this case. Yeah, of course. Thank you. Nikolai Nielsen. Thank you.